possibly it will work. Um, hello, uh, I'm actually not recording the camera in the end, so I'll just, I'll just do the screen and I will go to there and I suppose we shall see what we shall see in an hour's time, whether it actually has recorded or broadcast. So um, thank you all very much for coming. I'm George Roberts. As I mentioned briefly, I'm going to do this in a fairly conventional manner. That is, I'm, I'm even going to read it um, and then have a discussion about what we're talking about. If you want to interrupt at any time, please do. If any of you either out there in the interweb or in here are tweeting, use that digilit as a hashtag and it might pick things up. Um, so, um, okay. Mm. Uh, this seminar was in part inspired by Kathy Davidson's recent provocative question. Um, she said, uh, digital literacy and agenda for the 21st century. If SOPA and PIPA had been passed into US law in 2002, would Wikipedia exist today? And then a follow-up question, if either law had passed in 2012, would Wikipedia exist in 2022? Why or why not discuss? Okay, that's a question, but then the provocative thing came in the next paragraph. If you cannot answer that question, you are not literate, nor are you in control of your life, even if you think you are. Um, so, what do you mean, not in control of my life? And I might go on to suggest, possibly, that if you hadn't heard of Kathy Davidson, the same could be asked, at least in certain fields. She's a professor of early American literature and former provost at Duke University, in the US. Davidson's active and influential in the uh, digital humanities movement, particularly through the Haystack organization. Um, and so, okay, before I become annoying, um, Haystack then, Haystack is the Humanities, Arts, Sciences, and Technology Collaboratory. Haystack asks, what would our research, technology, design, and thinking look like if we took seriously the momentous opportunities and challenges of our digital era. What happens when we stop privileging traditional ways of organizing knowledge and turn attention instead to alternative modes of creating, innovating, critiquing that better address the interconnected and interactive global nature of knowledge today, both in the classroom and beyond. And I acknowledge the irony in this form of presentation and we'll talk a little bit about that as we move forward. Digital practices are changing fast and this seminar is going to be an attempt to catch a tiger by a tail a little bit in an early outing and I've mentioned the first test of a keynote that I'm going to be giving up at Dundee in uh, June, 8th of June. So I'm going to look at the Brooks graduate attribute known as digital information and literacy and illustrate it through a few practices. Come on. Oh. There we go. Um, so you, you may be vaguely familiar with this form of words. This is kind of squeezed up a bit to fit more or less onto a PowerPoint slide. But digital literacy is described as functional access skills and practices necessary to become a confident, agile adopter of a range of technologies for personal, academic, and professional use. Um, and, and more, but it's really that first statement that kind of frames it, and which I'll use as we go through this a little bit to reflect on digital literacies. The practices I'm going to consider briefly are things like open educational resources, massive open online courses or MOOCs, the practice of social citation, um, academic multimedia, which this again also is a kind of an indicative part of, and distributed collaboration, and of course the move to Moodle. And that, that kind of plays into this whole thing here. 
Um, but first, some context. Hmm? Context? There he is. Um, the digital native. Um, research doesn't support the digital native hypothesis. Um, obviously, it's the dying Gaul, it's the dying digital native. We have to slay the digital native. Um, findings related to age are equivocal. Prior educational experience is clearly important, but technology is used in ways suggested by courses and tutors, technology in higher education. So this idea that students come and there's another generation and their brains are wired differently just doesn't stand up. There are now more recent taxonomies. Those of you who went to the Learning and Teaching Conference last year will have seen Dave White talking about the visitor and resident model. This is becoming hugely influential in certain circles of uh, educational development work in the UK. Um, and also, I think possibly more interesting is Dana Boyd's voyeur flanner model, which uh, tries to some extent address the value hierarchy and what I'll call online proficiency that both of these have, at, you know, lying under them. You know, visitors are more proficient in certain areas than residents, natives are more proficient than immigrants. That, there is kind of a hierarchy of proficiency. And what Boyd says is we're all showing off in certain ways and we're all observing either passively and actively in certain ways and what's interesting is who is doing this to whom and why. Um, there is ambivalence in discourses on digital literacy and I accept with Dave White that the digital is not a genre. There isn't a, a genre of digital. There are many. And just as there are many sort of social and linguistic practices that go along with the term literacy. Um, so for these purposes, and I know I'm amongst people who probably have much more sophisticated understandings of literacy than I do, but I will say literacy, including digital literacy, is the practice of enunciation in a community. Hence the title of this talk, Speaking into the Frontier. Speaking in the broadest sense, being, representing, or projecting an identity in through and to others who concur sufficiently to let you run along, to, as it were, let you be yourself in that environment. Um, our condition today, uh, I'll argue, with respect to digital literacy, is somewhat, it's analogous to the condition of pre-literate peoples whose unwritten beliefs descend through mythology and folk tales. Like children, for whom all things are new, it appears that we are only now barely learning how to read in that broadest sense and write, particularly, and to write the internet. You've all got your Raspberry Pis, by the way? <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yes, expressed an interest. But, um, and it's, it's analogous to narrative, perspective drawing, or the cinema, if you like. So technology is going way back, that sort of, you know, oral poetry into narrative, which fundamentally changed, we believe, the way people were able to see and understand the world. In the Renaissance, things like perspective drawing came in, and all of a sudden, we had another way of seeing depth, and instead of sort of, you know, things up at the top of the picture were far away, and things at the bottom of the picture were close, and everything was the same side, this sort of flat field turned into depth of field, and we were able to, from there, go into all sorts of other perceptions. The internet and the cinema with its concept, the early cinema um, using the stagecraft of the theater as its sort of operating principle rapidly came to discover things like fades, dissolves, flashbacks. And we were able to take this sort of linear narrative and break it up in different ways, enabled us to see things differently. And I think the internet and hypertext is of that order of change. It's one of those watershed technologies that has the power to make us children again, children both in our joy and wonder, as well as squabbling over those sort of seemingly trivial points. It's my digital literacy, mine, mine, mine. Um, Stephen Heppel asks, do the new technologies herald the beginning of an era of a new broader literacy? And Paul Taylor says, we're forced to consider the possibility that literacy does not combat exclusion. He distinguishes between the literacy of reading, which creates the possibility of consensus, educating citizens for compliance, 
and an iconoclastic literacy of writing, of enunciation, of particularly writing against or putting the writing on the wall, if you will. And so the reference to broadside politics um, going back some, some years. <clears throat> Julia Kristeva says writing is an act of participation with respect to reality and is the prisoner of a conception that confuses language with spoken language. So through our computers, I'm arguing, we engage with this new literacy. And the internet, like narrative, like perspective drawing or the cinema before, teaches us to see things in new ways, in ways that we had not been able to previously. Uh, to imagine a world today without the internet is, I think, also to imagine a holocaust. Although it may not keep us warm or take us from A to B like planes and trains, it's not exactly as if we can't live without it. It's just that if we were to try and get rid of it, we'd have to get rid of so many of the things that make the world what it is today. A world without the internet is a world without electricity, telephones, most manufactured goods. It would take the loss of fundamental parts of our lives now to rid us of the medium. So to invert the argument, Without the internet, we would be, at least metaphorically, grubbing in the earth with sticks. Because to efface it, it would be necessary to efface much of what our civilization has achieved. The dominant order, however, of course, is striving to colonize the internet. And the question that I think we need to deal with is whether we can put it beyond that domination. And that, for me, really is the principal digital literacy question, where I want to go with this talk. We are Heppels, if I can really see Heppels. It's really not very good. Turn the light off, shouldn't I? Still not very good. Still not very good. Um, it's, 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 this is a picture of Neo Tokyo from uh, the Neuromancer uh, game version. <laughs> um, a vision of the sort of slightly dystopian vision of a world um, under complete domination of the network. Um, so anyway, we're Heppel's digitally literate children, we're Chris Davis, pre-literate oral poets. We, I argue, are making the myths that people 10,000 years from now might read as we now read Gilgamesh, Beowulf, or Achilles. It's this digital literacy we need to contend with, and it's through institutions shaped by digital literacy, digitally literate institutions, if you will, the digitally literate university, you know, with the plug over there and... <laughs> cable over here and things don't quite work, you know, we aren't quite talking to each other as well as we should. Um, ICT remains at the center of discussions, though, about practice in higher education, reading all the policy documents, you, the, you know, we must make more use of it because of various reasons. However, learner expectations are exposing gaps in institutional ICT provision. Um, according to a recent work by the NUS, many lecturers quote, still lack even the most rudimentary ICT skills, and this has major implications for learning experiences. Dave White again observes in a different paper that first among the potential barriers to the expansion of online learning is, and quote, the resistance of academic staff to adopting new approaches. But questions of boundaries within the field remain. Laurie Phipps observes that there's sometimes this conflation of broader ICT strategies, you know, having the hardware and so on, with a more, what he considers to be a more narrow e-learning or learning and teaching strategy. But teachers might well feel the impact the other way around, that wider pedagogic strategies are constrained by narrower ICT strategies. And I'd like to suggest that the reluctant lecturer is as much a myth as the digital native. I think this is a a problem that uh, we need to contend with, you know. We aren't the problem. The discussion veers from the messianic to the apocalyptic. Either the barbarians are at the gates or the sunlit uplands beckon. Um, Peter Thiel, um, another one of those, if you haven't heard of him, look him up. Peter Thiel was the first investor in Facebook after the kid dropped out of Harvard and went to California. Peter Thiel got rich with PayPal and founded a political action committee in the U.S. known as the, ooh, what is it? Oh, I've forgotten the name of the 
Anyway, it's one of the, the strap on the Silicon Valley's most influential conservatives and power regular guys. Um, a big funder of George Bush's campaign, a longtime campaigner against social inclusion, um, affirmative action, and all of those kind of things. Um, but somebody, people listened to him because he was the first person to invest in Facebook, because he invented PayPal, and because he's got gazillions of dollars. Um, Peter Thiel's consideration, he suggests that there is a higher education bubble. And he puts higher education in the same category of the tulip bubble, as it were. Um, and a recent discussion, he, he says, this expansion of higher education, this uh, widening participation agenda is creating a bubble in social expectations analogous to the dot-com boom, analogous to the tulip bubble, and it's all going to come tumbling down because, in fact, higher education is grossly overvalued. Uh, wouldn't surprise me. Wouldn't surprise me. I, it, it, that would be, there is a very logical connection there. Um, I don't know, though, so I don't, I don't want to say, oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Um, a, recently this, um, a recent Guardian article um, signaled much of the so-called frontier thinking, the references in there, worth following up. And the newly published Higher Education White Paper holds similar sorts, uh, well, not quite newly, it's a couple months old now, of what I'll call cowboy economics, or that they call frontier thinking. I think frontier thinking is as much cowboy economics even to the extent in the white paper, and I quote, flabbergasted, include, this is in respect to student debt and student fees, including the potential for the government to realize value for the taxpayer from a sale of this growing portfolio. They intend to securitize student debt and flog it. So are we going to see a bubble in subprime student loans? being part of the picture. And I, I, I just sort of, you, know, you read it and I just can't believe it was there, and that is, it is. Um, so, well we might. Uh, discourses around higher education are a field of competition for the legitimate exercise of symbolic violence, an arena of conflict between rival principles of legitimacy and competition for political economic and cultural power. It's not just about can you use a keyboard. It's a system for educating people to be both producers of certain cultural goods as well as consumers of those goods. So digital literacy is far more than skills with a keyboard and apps. It's how we and our students negotiate this ICT mediated frontier zone between rival principles. So who are these people, if you like? Um, we'll be familiar with BPP, the first private for-profit degree awarding institution in the UK, um, principally focused on training lawyers and uh, accountants. Um, we had a long stand, Brooks had a long standing partnership with BPP in the delivery of the ACCA, the Association of Chartered and Certified Accountants, uh, distance learning, MBA. Um, so BPP enrolled 5,000 people in the UK in 2011. So it's not insignificant in terms of its instant penetration into the higher education sector. Western International University, you read their stuff and it's all about go, the West is an ideological concept in Western International uh, University. It's a leading for-profit in the US, expanding into Europe, Asia, and South America. Both BPP and Western International are owned by a company called Apollo Global. And Apollo Global is also the parent company of the University of Phoenix, which is the largest of the private for-profit degree awarding institutions in the US, principally focused on healthcare, teacher training, and uh, management, management disciplines, if I can call them that. Um, Apollo is in turn wholly owned by the Carlyle Group. Carlyle, a major investor in Blackboard, our learning technology platform, um, and many other things. Uh, Carlyle also owns the Wall Street Institute, which is one of the biggest online language training uh, companies. 
This group of institutions offers a curriculum heavily underpinned by ICT, both blended and distance learning, with clear employability goals and a particular underpinning ethos. This ethos is nested in Carlisle, which is a large venture capital group whose focus for its investments is to, quote, increase private participation in the delivery of formerly public sector services, healthcare, education, security, resilience, and defense. Okay, their mission, and among their board of directors are people like George, uh, George Bush Sr., uh, John Major, and quite a sort of uh, an array of former politicians of a particular flavor. So, with this as the context, I'd say digital literacy cannot be separated from other educational or social or economic or political developments. So I'm not necessarily arguing in one side or the other, but that this is the game that's being played around this thing called digital literacy. And all this, is, oh, so, and who else, sorry? Wait, you, 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 So who are the other players? Um, come on, come on, come on, come on. So, so if you like, uh, on a, in a different side, on another side, it's all building to a notion of open online practice, which offers a radical practice, uh, radical challenge to what Richard Hall calls the polyarchic limits to the discussion of digital literacy within institutions which are in conflict with themselves. And this challenge is breaking the bounds of the enclosed debate about employability in the knowledge economy and connecting the work of the academy to the dislocated realities of the world beyond. A world where even the credentialing of knowledge, once you know, sort of our sacred preserve, if you like, is under assault by both popular and elite movements. So popular movements like the Khan Academy. You familiar with Khan Academy? Khan Academy offers uh, free instruction via YouTube videos at sort of high school, first year undergraduate level in all sorts of subjects, but primarily math, science, technology. Um, big recipient of Gates Foundation funding. Um, Coursera is a spin out from Stanford University, which offers Stanford University's curriculum in free, open, online modes. And MITx is MIT's new massive, open, free education portal. They are porting. Ten years ago, MIT set a cat amongst the pigeons by making all of their course content available in the open courseware movement. They are now doing the open pedagogy, open academic practice online with, you know, you can log in and you can take the course with MIT, with their students, with the teacher, follow the curriculum yourself, and you don't get MIT credit for it. Um, so, according, uh, this is sort of a little bit of a jump here. According to Kathy Davidson, uh, this, is, this is the credentialing issue, right? Badges. My goodness gracious me, I thought badges were geeks playing games. Badges have become serious business all of a sudden with the digital media learning competition offering badges for lifelong learning, badges for vets, get uh, people who once were in the service jobs. Um, you, can you be a budget balancer? Um, Badges equal vet visual representations of a skill or achievement. Um, badges, according to Davidson, are peer-given contribution and reputation points. Badges are a visible symbol of a complex system of rigorous peer evaluation. I thought it was just because you were a good DJ on Last FM, you know. Um, it, it's gone, it's really caught me by surprise. With reference to that, tiger at the beginning, um, as Balu says, there are teeth in the other end. Um, so, where does this sort of take us? Where, where are we going with all of this? Um, the e-learning myth has always been in part built on the proposition that more people can be taught by fewer, 
However, if knowledge and skills are functions of relationships between people and are essentially constructed in dialogue, the packaging model doesn't work. And I think that's one of the things that is being addressed by MIT and Stanford through Coursera and MITx and Udacity and various others, is that they realize that it's people coming together, talking to one another, which is how they learn. They don't learn solely by consuming open courseware. But new networks and groups might so okay, open courseware isn't the answer, but there may very well be new ways of organizing knowledge, hence this sort of badges concept. If badges, um, one of the things that you'll be interested here in this, uh, the references in the paper, um, one of the big areas in which badges are being deployed in the US is in teacher training. Ways of trying to address the No Child, uh, no child Left Behind um, initiative and trying to stimulate teachers to get um, sort of, you know, I'm a, you know, I'm, I, I've got a science merit badge. It's, it's, but in a very serious way of tracking continuing professional development performance. Uh, this has been trialed and experimented with now. What's, what are we going to do about that here? You know, do, we, do we dismiss it? You know, it's just silly. Or are we going to see these developments start sort of creeping in? And, how, and what's our response to it? Are we, for example, going to encourage the Higher Education Academy to offer a badge for your PG cert? I mean, that's, in, in my little world, you know, we talk about badging degrees and so on. All of a sudden, it's gaining real traction. Um, okay, so now I'm going to turn to those actual practices here at Brooks. Um, that range of technologies that we talked about. Um, But, sorry, this, uh, this probably should be another slide in here, which just reminds us of this confident, agile adopter of a range of technologies for personal, academic, and professional use. And these are, I suggest, very high up that range of technologies. This is my sort of looking at the future uh, in the next two to three years. Not a, I don't do, I don't know about the long-term future. Um, but I'm convinced that these are the things that are going to, if you like, come up and bite us if we don't watch out. So open academic practice is an element of best academic practice. That would be the argument. That's the argument that comes out of the Stanford and MIT. But there is also kind of a mention of the sort of a neo-colonial move there. We are the best. We are Stanford. We can offer our courses free for the whole world and um, what does that imply? Um, several mentions have been made of the initiatives at Stanford and MIT. Our Open University is doing the same, but OER initiatives are much wider. The United Nations is a big supporter. UNESCO is a big supporter of um, open educational resources and open academic practices. There are debates about the new colonialism of powerful Western institutions dominating and shaping a global higher education curriculum through their open education resources. But then you say, should we put up a protectionist wall against Stanford? What's wrong with um, institutions in uh, less wealthy parts of the world having access to Stanford's entire curriculum and teachers and, and so on? But at the other side, what if those new providers, the BPP, the Carlyle family, use things like the GATS mechanism to say this free courseware model is anti-competitive? Um, and this, so that debate is, is going on. Um, we, Brooks, has made a commitment to open educational resources through the establishment of the RADAR repository. RADAR was adopted by the university for both research and critically teaching resources. And they're grouped into collections, but interestingly, the majority of our teaching collections are in the open side of things. Partly because that just makes life a whole lot easier. You don't have to log in. You don't have to sort of think about where you are. Um, but given enough support, we anticipate that more and more of our teaching resources will move into the open. We're moving the whole postgraduate certificate into the open, um, confirming our commitment, if you like, to the release uh, and reuse of our materials within the educational development community. There's this sort of idea that 
We need to protect the value in our course by locking things away and not letting people have it. No, you want it, it's there. Course handbooks online. I had a phone call from somebody in, um, I forget, Singapore, Malaysia. We're developing a, uh, an online, we're developing a postgraduate certificate. You know, is there anything you can do to help us? Well, here's the website, you know. You know, come back and talk if you want to later. So it's just sort of going whoosh. Um, massive open online courses, a MOOC by itself is a non-defined pedagogical format. Um, MOOCs are a recent innovation in educational development and have attracted a lot of interest in um, sort of a, a particular subset of the community. They started as sort of a cottage industry in Canada, driven by people like George Siemens, Stephen Downs, Alex Koros, and others. And just last year, they burst out into the mainstream as Stanford offered its introduction to artificial intelligence, taught by Sebastian Thrun. And this is where it gets interesting, to over 160,000 participants. Now, it wasn't, you know, a few people. Um, and of those 160,000, you do have these kind of scaling effects. 160,000 people logged on and sort of looked at it occasionally. Something like 6,000 people took the course from beginning to end. 180 some odd were enrolled at Stanford as students at Stanford for credit. Of those 180 people, by the end of the course, 50 of them were going to class and the remaining 130 had dropped out, as it were, and were doing the online version, still submitting their assessments for, because they found it was just so much more fun. Now, Sebastian Thrun, who developed it, is Google's artificial intelligence expert. He's a big draw in the field. He's the person who in, wrote the software that Google uses for their driverless cars. Did you know that Google has six cars driving around the US with no drivers in them? And they've got Department of Transport approval for this? <laughs> Interesting. Um, there's only been one accident. <laughs> um, anyway, so so, so this guy says, okay, I'll teach you artificial intelligence, and he's sort of dominant figure, and a lot of people come and sign up. Um, through MOOCs, this sort of wider participation, uh, the wider uh, possibilities of education in the digital age are being explored. Um, and we're doing a MOOC in the first part of the postgraduate certificate in teaching in higher education in May, June, we got funding, a uh, small grant from the Higher Education Academy to develop and run first steps into learning and teaching as a massive open online course. So I don't know whether 20 people will come or 2,000 people will come. Um, so it should be, it should be interesting. Um, social citation, social bookmarking, reference management. Um, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -bum. Um, yeah, the web's moved a long way beyond EndNote and Delicious. I'm convinced that social bookmarking, reference management, and citation tools are essential to contemporary academic practice. You've got to be tracking your reading through things like EndNote Web, if you happen to be a user of EndNote Web. Zotero is my favorite, Cite You Like, other ones. And then you, make, you expose your reading to your community. People see what you're reading, you see what other people are reading, and you either have an echo chamber effect or a sort of expanding aggregation of knowledge effect. Um, so, uh, partly with my tongue in my cheek, I suggest that the obvious thing is for everybody to get a Bibsonomy account, friend each other, and agree some common tags, and everybody get Zotero and share their libraries. All right, what's wrong with that picture? How can we as teachers fix it? You have tools that don't talk to one another easily. You know, I've got to dump everything out in BibRef and upload it, or did text and upload it into something else. And, ah. Anyway, um, new non-text representations of knowledge, things like podcasting, lecture capture, audio and video feedback, that's why I'm trying to record this, um, are challenging traditional epistemologies. How do we know if it's true if it isn't in text in a stable printed form? And we're coming, we, we don't know the answer to that, I suggest. That, but that we have to start contending with it. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole sort of field of participatory media for academic purposes, 
uh, talk I gave about a year, year and a half ago on it, but there's lots of links to follow up and see who is making their, uh, making their sort of academic positions known through multimedia. Um, finally, distributed collaboration. Uh, Chickering and Gamson published a summary of research into improved student performance. You may be familiar with Chickering and Gamson. Um, again, those, all this is nice and pre-digital, 1987. Well, not pre-digital, but pre-internet. Anyway, um, seven factors which impact positively. That's in terms of uh, reduced drops and fails, um, higher grade point average at the end of the course, more ones and two ones. Um, and that's high levels of, and it's kind of obvious, but there's an awful lot of research that supports it. High levels of tutor-student contact, high levels of student-student contact, encouraging active learning, emphasizing time and time. quite the opposite of what we're doing now. Now well, you're actively listening, of course. Um, giving prompt feedback, um, and principally those first five, if you like, focus on, so the outcome, the consequence of this is a focus on what we'll call facilitated group work. Student, student contact, active learning, time on task. And what group work does correlate with high performance. Make them do group work, they will get better grades. But it also correlates with lower student satisfaction. They do well, but they hate it. So what do we do in that situation? Um, but it's not all it is. Distributed collaboration has several dimensions. In one sense, it's just group work in a distance learning environment, seen through the world of work through projects of the sort being developed and trialed by FX Pal, the new name for the Palo Alto Research Laboratories, or the people that invented the mouse and the click and point screen. Um, it can also be seen in flash mobs used in mobile gaming, social change activism, and even social disturbance. The Arab Spring movement can be seen as an example of wide-scale distributed collaboration. And the London and other city riots last summer had a collaborative social media element to them. The kids went to jail for saying, let's riot on Facebook. Um, distributed collaboration. This, this is a clip out of uh, live stream. This is Occupy Barcelona. This is a meeting last night. There were 70,000 people in the street. And these people were talking about what to do, um, and they just sort of stream it live. Um, distributed collaboration has to be a focus, whether it's working in global corporations or against global corporations. Our students need to be versed in these practices. They need to be aware that this is going on. A lot of them will be, some of them might not be. So finally, the move to Moodle. Is Moodle the answer to a maiden's prayer? Oh Lord, send me. A brutal. Um, or at least it's an opportunity. Um, through the INSTEP project, student e-pioneers are being recruited. And one key role these e-pioneers is going to have is to support the move to Moodle as Moodle supporters. There's our young pioneers sort of marching into the future, this grand new world. Um, and he, or, or is Moodle just going to be another VLE? You know, let, let's be a little bit careful about the kind of loading the future of the university. Once we get Moodle, it's all going to be perfect, isn't it? I'm, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> it is going to be perfect, I assure you. So, an e-pioneer who is a Moodle supporter is an advocate for students to make Moodle as best as Moodle can be within the constraints of what may be possible with Moodle and the hosted technology platform. The purpose of the role is to identify core entitlements for other students. And I've just been told that I'm not allowed to use the term entitlements. That's a problematic term in the new regime with fees and so on. So we have to think of a new word that sort of says students are able to expect that they'll get a decent technology platform, but they're not entitled to it. They need digital skills as well as the wider digital literacies to take a creative lead in developing and employing core digital literacies for students and staff by communicating, advocating, and mediating effectively for and between students and course teams, advising on what is important for learners in the online world. And this, it, it's hoped, would lead to more effective implementation. So the idea is actually giving students responsibility. The, in a, again, ideally, every module might have a student Moodle pioneer attached to it 
telling us how we've got it wrong or how we've got it right or what we could do or wouldn't it be cool if you could only do this um, and so that that's being developed now so hopefully next September there will be Mo a certain number of Moodle e pioneers, students working alongside course teams, working alongside digital media, uh, e-learning um, staff, and so on. Um, so, finally, I guess to leave it there, Stephen Downs observed digital literacy is as fundamental and is yet distinct from the literacy of the printed word. The internet has introduced us to a world in which we can communicate with each other in a wide variety of media, where formerly we could only talk and sing to each other. Now we can create videos, author animations, link to videos and images and cartoons and more, mix and match these in a complex, open-ended vocabulary. What it means to be literate in such an information age is fundamentally distinct from the literacy of the three R's and teaching this new literacy is an evolving challenge for those of us who are still struggling to learn it. You know, and we are, we're all struggling in this field. There is no one thing that is higher education or a university and as increasingly crowdsourced qualifications, these badges, massive open online courses start to gain traction, the discussion about what higher education is I suggest is going to change faster than we might think or wish. Thank you. <laughs> uh, trying to work out my thoughts on digital literacy and how it's an awful lot more than just having a taxonomy and putting your stuff up and letting students do their assignments in PowerPoint rather than in Word. Uh, I think I'll turn this off now because um, I've gone on for...